I believe uh, we are again back to the routine non-fighting mode. I will be talking about uh, ameliorating the glycemic variability and staying in the range, which is time in range, uh, with the use of uh, a long-acting or ultra-long-acting basal insulin analog, which is none other than Degludec. How do you take it ahead? How do you move the slide? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. All right, all right. So the first part will be glycemic variability. I will try to uh, briskly grow through that. Then the implications of GV and then the reduction of GV by the insulin degludec. So in a very simple term actually, uh, if you really want to look at uh, glycemic variability, it is none other than simple fluctuations in the blood sugar levels. And if you do the blood sugar levels by a glucometer or maybe in a laboratory or maybe in a continuous glucose monitor, you will find that the glucose is always going up and down. And that up and down is even more pronounced in a patient who is diabetes. Patient who is type 1 diabetes, even the fluctuations are still more wide. So that's the glycemic variability. And uh, then we have normal ranges also. For example, the, uh, on a continuous glucose monitoring, if you really look at, then this is the 70 on the lower side, the dotted line, and the upper side is 180. So you see that there are a lot of variations which are far actually wider than even that 70 on the lower side and the 180 on the upper side. These are the downslopes or the hypoglycemias. You can see here, this is hyperglycemia. Again, a hyperglycemia going even beyond the uh, 300 mark that way. And uh, that's how you have. Now, why this is important? So till this time, we were really relying more on the fastings and the postprandials and the HbA1Cs. But HbA1Cs, as we understand, does not tell you the story of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. Both hypo as well as hyperglycemia are related to the quality of life. Hypoglycemia is especially related to the quality of life of the patient. It is related to the family of the patient. And it is, of course, related to you also. And hypo and hyperglycemia can really invite complications faster than maybe a stable glucose. So there are two patients here. Both have a similar HbA1c. So patient A as well as patient B, they have similar HbA1c 7.8. But as you can see, patient number A, the gray line, she has a less variability. But the patient number B, he has a high variability. So high variability is something which we need to really catch and we want to bring it down. And that's the reason why I'm talking today. So this is just an example of uh, continuous glucose monitoring record of seven days. And uh, there is a method or there is a biostatistical method by which we measure. So amplitude ups and downs of the sugars, they are measured in the terms of standard deviation or coefficient of variation. Then the axis of time, the x-axis on a glucose monitoring, uh, if we really uh, look at that, then it is time axis. So the y-axis is sugar, uh, x-axis is time. And the amplitude is naturally the sugars, and the time is on the uh, horizontal or x-axis. We actually are interested in both the time spent in normal or abnormal ranges as well as the amplitudes of excursions. So this is a clear-cut example of that. This is the amplitude, the upstroke or downstroke of the respective sugars. And that's how actually you look at that. And as I told you, this is a time axis or the x-axis. So uh, we need to know how much time the person has spent in either a low range, hypoglycemia, high range, hyperglycemia, or in the normal range, which is a time in range. So that's the... Uh, way we study. So standard deviation is what? It is variation around mean blood glucose and it can give you an intraday or interday uh, picture of glycemic variability. Coefficient of variation is the magnitude of variability related to the mean blood 
glucose. Generally, I will tell you, generally the normal range, normal of standard deviation is around 30, some people 36, some people 25. Similar figures for coefficient of variation also. But in practice, if you really try to uh, calculate the standard deviation or CV for a given particular patient who is undergoing a CGM, you will find that the figures most of the times are 50 plus. If it is type 1, it can be even 60 plus. So GV is a big issue as far as practice is concerned. So this is measuring the GV. Uh, as I have told you, this is the time measurement. So patient goes up, it has been plotted yellow. Then the patient is in normal range, that is uh, green. And the patient goes low, that is plotted as red. In fact, there is a color coding for every CGM system and most of the colors, now for example, the Abbott system that gives you yellow as a high sugar and red as a low sugar. In between is the normal and then that gives you the time at target as well. Generally, the uh, time in ranges was something with, with this is an international consensus which was published Diabetes Care 2019. Uh, our friend Dr. Bansi Sabu was, of course, a part of this writing committee. And this committee has actually told us that look at which patient you are handling. If it is an ordinary patient, in the sense a non-pregnant adult, and he is maybe somebody who is not a senior citizen, so a type 1, type 2, whatever, generally the time in range should be, the patient should be traveling in time in range for around... 70% of times, which is generally 17 hours out of 24 hours. That's the expectation. And then the remaining time, what is the remaining time recommendation? The remaining time recommendation is something which is either time above range or time below range. So time above range, there are two levels again. Above 180 is grade 1. About 250 is grade 2. And if the patient has a hyperglycemic emergency, metabolic emergency, that is grade 3. TAR or time above range. Similarly, time below range less than 70 is type grade 1, less than 54 is grade 2. Unconscious patient or maybe convulsing patients, etc., that is grade 3. So these are the grades, and you expect that 70% of a typical given diabetic patient should pass in uh, 70 to 180, and not more than 20 time above range, not more than 5 less than. Uh, 70, so time below range. So that's the general expectation. If the patient is older one, then the time in range is restricted. It is something around 50. So 12 hours the patient, you, are, you expect him to pass in 70 to 180. You want to curtail that hypoglycemia, which can be a bigger cost, both money-wise as well as clinic-wise, to the patient. So you don't want the patient to land in hypoglycemia. And that's the situation where you will see that uh, older patient, whether type 1 or type 2, you will want to steer clear of hypo. You can allow the patient to be in a hyperglycemic range for a longer period of time, which may be somewhere around 30 to 35 percent, but no time below range for, let's say, maybe around 4, 4 to 5 percent. So that's a, a few minutes of time. If the patient is pregnant, so if this is a, a patient, either this type 1 or this is a GDM or a known diabetic getting pregnant. Then you can see here that the time expected to be passed between the normal range, time in range, they are expected to pass more than 70%. In fact, practically 85 to 90% of times they are supposed to pass in time in range. The time in range in pregnant patients is not 70 to 180, but it is somewhere which is even tighter. It is 63 to 140. So these are some of the rules which have been laid down by uh, the different uh, experts. It is actually uh, for us, which we have been harping on HbA1c for a very long period of time, depending on the time in the range, there are formulae through which you can deduce the HbA1c also. So generally, if it is 70% of time in the range, the patient is traveling, generally the HbA1c calculates to somewhere around seven. There could be a decimal point here and there. So we are expecting or we are interested in not only reducing the amplitude of glucose excursions, but we want the patient to pass as long a time in range, 70 to 180, as possible. Now, what are the implications of glycemic variability? Very, you can say, important, why? because ultimately, why are these important? So for a person who is uh, landing in 
non severe hypoglycemia so these are very you can say clear cut observation there, there are three axes as you can see this is hba1c and it is a common sense that higher the hba1c the less there is a lesser likelihood of the patient getting into hypoglycemia because you are not trying to reach the target now the y axis is the likelihood of getting hypoglycemia and the z axis is the variability which is that standard deviation in millimoles per liter you can see here that as you try to come from that 8.5 or above to 7.5 the risk of hypoglycemia or the number of hypoglycemic episodes the risk is going to be a bit higher and as you can see here if the hba1c is high then the risk of hypoglycemia is low however if the glycemic variability is high then still that risk of number of hypoglycemia is going to be higher so keep in mind that high hba1c does not necessarily mean that this person will not have hypoglycemia the other side of high hba1c could be a low sugar or a hypoglycemia so that is of something which we have to appreciate you come down the ladder of hba1c so rather than 8.5 plus now between 7.5 to 8.5 see here that the risk is less but with a higher gv the risk goes on increasing and tighter hba1c 7.5 or less naturally the risk of hypo is more and with higher gv again on the z you will have a higher risk of getting non severe hypoglycemia so this we have to keep in mind it is it has been already appreciated that glycemic variability can generate oxidative stress the risk of complications especially the microvascular complications the leakiness of the capillaries of the retina risk of getting microalbuminuria delayed nerve conduction velocities all this has been proved in fact the there are been uh, studies which have shown correlation of higher gv with development of carotid intima media thickness the atherosclerotic uh, surrogate marker as well so we uh, when we see fasting as well as postprandial hyperglycemia and high hba1c plus high glucose fluctuations that can create oxidative stress and that can raise the risk of complications and that's the reason why we want to reduce glycemic variability now if we look at the major adverse cardiovascular events as well as all cause mortality you can see here that the lesser the black is the low variability so the lesser the variability the major adverse cardiovascular events they are relatively less you go higher up the ladder so if there is a medium variability then the risk of maze goes up and if there is a high variability high glycemic variability the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events goes up similarly for all cause mortality also higher the gv higher is the risk of all cause mortality so these are patient related outcomes naturally they are going to be important for both you as well as for the patient so how do you really reduce glycemic variability let me tell you that there are apart from what i am going to present there are number of you can say other measures trying to be regular in your uh, time tables your regular eating times your regular exercise times so on and so forth the quantity of the meals the composition of the meals etc for all these if you try to do in a healthy person your glycemic variability or fluctuations will come down if you are a diabetic then regularity of taking the medication regularity of again the diet exercise etc certainly that will reduce the glycemic variability if you are not put on an insulin or an sulfonylurea or a megalitinide your risk of glycemic fluctuations will come down because incretin drugs alpha glucosidase inhibitors glitazones metformin hglt2 inhibitors they don't give you hypoglycemia so the risk of gv or increasing the gv is relatively lesser with this group of drugs having said that we have a very uh, you can say advanced uh, ultra long acting insulin insulin degludec which has a inbuilt unfledging mechanism of keeping an insulin level steady in the blood after injection of course over a long period of time and there is hardly any risk of inter or intra patient variability in the uh, blood levels or plasma levels of insulin so because of the flat action profile of these ultra long acting insulin degludec the risk of glycemic variability is certainly lesser and in some of these studies like for example this hypo deg trial which is done in type 1 diabetic patients the two insulins glargine insulin glargine which is a basal insulin uh, 
first generation designer basal insulin that is compared against the second generation basal insulin, insulin degludec, and you can see that the glycemic variability parameter, which is coefficient of variation, over a period of 24 hours, there is a significantly lower CV coefficient of variation with degludec. Diurnal, both insulin glargine 100 and insulin degludec, they are comparable. Nocturnal, which is a big problem for the patient, for you also. So in nocturnal period of time, there is a significantly lower coefficient of variation with insulin degludec. So this is something which is very important as far as you as and your patient is concerned. Now this is a very, you can say, illustrative graph. The, uh, there are two insulins shown here and one graph, sorry, one graph is the pre-intervention, that is the blue graph. And you can see here that the levels are going to go up and down. This is a 24-hour glycemic profile and there is a fair amount of up and down uh, in the pre-intervention, that is the pre-insulin degludec glucose profile. After intervention, look at the red line. You can see here that the fluctuations are certainly lesser on the uh, x-axis, that is the time axis, and even if you look at the amplitude of the glycemic fluctuations, then compared to the blue, the reds are certainly more squeezed. So, the calculation of CV, if you really look at baseline 44.7 at the end of 12 weeks, uh, of injection of degludec, your CV comes down to 33.6. Standard deviation also comes down from 71.3 to 49.8. So in patients with high glycemic variability, injection degludec significantly brings down glycemic variability. This is something which is a different kind of a, a study. This is uh, one study where the patients are already on some other basal insulin and uh, they are now switched. So initially they are on degludec OD and oral antidiabetics. Other group is on insulin glargine 100 and oral antidiabetics. And in between the study, after 16 weeks, the degludec people went on to glargine and the glargine people went on to degludec. So this is the switch pro randomized control trial comparing the degludec and insulin glargine again, insulin glargine 100. And the most important part here as there is a, uh, you can say, monitoring by a continuous glucose monitor, Freestyle Libre Pro, between week 16 to week uh, 34, that is the end of the study. And what are the observations? Superiority of degludec is confirmed. The estimated treatment difference is a significant 1.43%, which calculates to around 21 minutes per day in favor of degludec. So degludec patients remain longer in time in range compared to insulin glargine 100 patients. and the overall time in what is called as a tight range. I told you about 70 to 180, which is a standard time in range, but some people say that something which is 70 to 140, uh, maybe narrower time window, it is called as a time in tight range. So with insulin degludec, the patients pass 21.9 minutes per day more in time in tight range. So certainly this is a very good proof that glycemic variability comes down with a long-acting insulin degludec compared to insulin large in 100. Now, the other age, this is something which is again important for clinicians. More patients achieved a clinically significant difference, which is more than 5% of time in range with use of degludec. So 39.5% of the patients, they actually improved on time in range parameter by more than 5% compared to those who are uh, on insulin large in one, of course, 28.8% patients on insulin glargine 100 also had an improvement, but numerically, uh, more number of patients improved time in range better with insulin degludec. Now, what about the nocturnal time below range, nocturnal hypoglycemia, which is a bane of all insulin users and which is a very big problem for both you as well as me. So, with uh, insulin degludec, what has happened? Look at the nocturnal level one. Level one, as I told you, is less than 70, and level two is less than 54. So level one, there was a reduction of time in hypoglycemia, time below range, by 8.5 minutes with degludec than IGLR 100. And level two, that also came down by 4.2 minutes per day with degludec. So the risk of both one as well as two level of hypoglycemia, nighttime hypoglycemia, total 12.17 minutes per night was reduced 
by injection degludec rather than injection IGLR-100. This is something which is relatively, uh, let's say, recent publication here. Injection degludec and IGLR-300, the two second generation basal insulins are compared against each other. This is a large prospective multicentric study. The only objection to this study as far as me as a person is concerned, these are type 1s and that two type 1s who are relatively uh, longer living ones. So those who live, are living with type 1 and 18 to 70 years of age, A1C between 7 to around 10 percent and they are on multi-dose insulin regimen with any uh, basal insulin and maybe the rapid acting insulin, so typical uh, regimen except of course IGLR 300 or IDEG 100 and 338 patients then they were randomized half of them to IGLR 300 and half, half of them to IGLR, IDEG 100 and uh, of course the uh, basal insulin was titrated for the initial duration of the study 0 to 8 weeks and then on the patients were of course uh, doing a good 7 point self monitoring of blood glucose and some had undergone a continuous glucose monitoring study as well, which was that's something which is more objective. What was observed? Technically speaking, both these insulins fare fairly, you can say, fairly same. However, there were some details, and this is Degludeg versus IGLR 300. You can see here the first column is large in U 300, and the time in range 52.7 versus 55.1. Then the glucose. Total coefficient of variation 39.9 versus 41.2. A1C 0.78 percent reduction, 0.96 percent reduction. Time less than 70, 5.55, 6.49. Time more than 180, 41.52, 38.31. And rate of severe hypo events per patient year, 0.2 versus 0.3. Rate of nocturnal hypo, again events per patient year, 11.9 versus 11.9. So, Degludeg versus IGLR 300, time in range 44.2 minutes more with Degludeg, time above range 44.94 uh, minutes lesser and HbA1c relatively lower with Degludeg. For practitioners, <coughs> this may or may not be really very important. Suffice to say that if you want to reduce GV, we have better insulins and striving to achieve near normal glycemia and avoiding glycemic fluctuations could be beneficial to the patient. Increasing the GV increases the risk of hypo as well as the micro and macrovascular complications. Options to decrease the risk of glycemic variability should be considered. I have already mentioned a few beyond insulin as well and ultra long acting basal insulin analogs like insulin degludec, they can significantly reduce the glycemic variability by improving the time in range. My friends, I thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, chairpersons.